Thank you again for listening to The History of the Papacy. I'm your host, Steve. We are on Patreon, and it's a great way to support the show. There's four tiers, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. By becoming a member on Patreon of the club, you will be included on the History of the Papacy diptych, which in historical Christianity and traditional Christianity is the list of bishops commemorated in order of their ordinations. So if you want to be on that list, you got to sign up to be on higher up on the list. You'll also get bonus audio, video content, Pope coin coming soon, monthly book drawings, early content, and ad free content. And like I said, sign up early so you have your name on the top of the list. And really, for as little as 10 cents a day U.S., you can join this list. If you want to be on the tops of the lists at the Rome level, it's less than 50 cents a day. And there's great benefits to becoming a Patreon on Rome, including getting a free T-shirt. I know times are tough these days. Believe me, I know. Your donations go so far and are just a long way to helping me keep this whole operation going. So whether it's joining on Patreon, giving a rating and review on iTunes, buying me some research materials from my Amazon wish list, sending in a comment or feedback to my email address, or just listening to the show, it's all just very, very much appreciated. Now let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William, Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, John, and Sarah at the Alexandria level. We have Dapo, Paul, Justin, and Lana, all of whom are magnificent at Constantinople and reaching that ultimate power and prestige that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great. Today we have more from our Summer of Scholarship series. This episode features Gil and Omri of the Podcast of Biblical Proportions. In their podcast, Gil and Omri explore the Bible through the lens of storytelling of the original storytellers. They try and peel back the onions, so to speak, to try and find out the history and the imagination of the people who wrote the Bible and lived during those early times. We had a wide-ranging conversation about the Second Temple Judaism, how the Christians and the Jews imagined the Bible after the destruction of the Second Temple. We also talk about how and why people form canons and why groups could diverge. It is a fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy, because I know I enjoy talking to Gil and Omri, and if you want to learn more about their podcasts or find links to how to support the show and much, much more, you can look in the show notes or go to a2zhistorypage.com. Hi, how are you guys today? Can you tell us a little bit about your podcast? Yeah, I am uh, Omri. This is Gil. We are from the Al Podcast of Biblical Proportions. Uh, we take a look at the Bible from a secular point of view. And the main point of the podcast is to get into the minds of the people who wrote it and even the minds of the people who listened to the stories or read it. We go almost episode by episode, a really deep dive. And through that dive, we also discover the ancient world and the way people thought about the ancient world. And we try to identify even the personal lives or the images and the day-to-day uh, experiences from which they drew their inspiration. Yeah, it's like... Uh basic thing like write what you know so there are the, the the biblical things the religious things that have to be there but then a person steps in and they write and they will write from their from themselves so we try to figure out the different uh, people and positions voices yeah different voices and different stories even within the story well we were just getting started too so this is i think we're going to be in good shape for today so uh, let's start by talking about uh, imagination. Uh, the thing that uh, we like to talk about is the gap between how people imagined the original stories, let's say, of Genesis, uh, in comparison to how 
modern people will imagine it. For example, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. So immediately for a modern person, the word heaven signifies some kind of a holy sky, a mythical sky, a place, a safe haven in which all your desires are fulfilled, a lot of light. It, for them, it was just the word for sky, a shamayim. It's just a regular sky. So the image that their mind evokes is a different image than the modern perspe perception. Another example is he created heaven and the earth. Earth, for a, modern, for a modern person, immediately evokes the image of Earth from space. The big ball, sphere, blue ball from outer space. For them, it was just a word for land or even surface. It was a very tangible, real image. And the first uh, creation story. A lot of modern people will imagine some kind of a big bang. Like there was the, the movie Noah uh, by uh, Darren, uh, Aaron Aronofsky, Darren Aronofsky. There's a sequence there uh, that uh, portrays the creation uh, of Earth. And it, as Noah is saying the first Genesis story, the images that uh, the audience see is like very modern images of space, of the Big Bang, of evolution, while he is recounting ancient texts and ideas. For them, the, the concept of nothingness wasn't even exactly dark as space. It well may be that nothingness was imagined as like a big blue vastness of oceans in which you can't really identify what is sky and what is, uh, and what is the ocean up until God, Elohim, separated between those two entities. So you can clearly see that their image is real. When they talk about uh, Ruach Elohim, the spirit of God, the word spirit for English speaking people is kind of a magical essence, a transcendent essence of uh, the soul of your identity. But for them, it's the same word as wind. So they imagined wind on water, not this divine, transcendent, abstract concept like modern people have. And I think there's a, a lot to unlearn when you go back to those ancient stories. And we have to unlearn all the past 2000 years of how people interpreted it. And it's, it's actually pretty hard. And I could see that when uh, Omri was retelling the stories, when he wanted to talk about water, he said ocean. Because it's so hard to get all the images of the ocean because the Mediterranean Sea is very small. They knew that it wasn't huge as an ocean. Just like shows the, how embedded are the modern uh, imaginations of uh, the story. One question I had in modern Hebrew, is there a difference between the word sky and heaven or are they the same word? No, there's a huge difference. Heaven is a concept that is kind of absent from Jewish thinking, especially biblical thinking. There wasn't really an afterlife. There was only Sheol, which is the closest that you get is Hades, uh, Hades from the Greek mythology. The word for heaven for us is the same word that we use for paradise and the Garden of Eden. That's the modern oh, okay. uh, Hebrew. When you want to say heaven, I'm going to heaven. You say, I'm going to the Garden of Eden, like in one word, Gan Eden. Because you see, like in some languages, like German comes to mind, heaven and sky are the same word. And so you get a totally different conception mm -hmm. if you were to read like say that that opening passage of genesis even in that you would get reading it in that way you would get a totally different conception in like english those two words get separated and they have a completely different meaning to each other even though the you know heaven's supposed to connotate something in the sky you might not even think of it that way if you're reading a text with that and it would be a totally different conception if you read it and it said that um, in the beginning god created the sky and the land or something like that even the word that they use sky if you uh, deconstruct that word that hebrew word it's 
basically you can kind of guess how their imaginative process worked because the word is shamaim which can be deconstructed to two words sham maim can be their water the concept of sky that they used in the first uh, genesis story was like water above and later in that story they actually tell you that god separated from water above and water below the images that passed in their brain was totally different than the images that we have just like uh, to buttress uh, omri's point that the word for sun uh, shemesh you could also deconstruct it the same way sham esh their fire so it's like ancient like words out of ancient origin like the fire over there not the fire that we have here and the water over there not the wi- water that we have here and this is very different than the story how we perceive it so steven i want to ask you about the christian imagination the evolution of the christian imagination if you can you know draw a line pick any period just like it as an outline how it evolved in a certain way that is you know cool to discuss well it's interesting because the christian idea of interpreting the old testament or the hebrew bible very from the well even from the very first days if you look at the earliest things that were written or even discussed like some um if we talk about the oral tradition that um, came from the Q source that they call, or even the very earliest Gospels, everybody's quoting from a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, the Septuagint. You know, whenever Jesus quotes something from the Septuagint or from the old stories, he's using the Septuagint version, and it's clear that he's, you know, using that. And it's it's very interesting because would have someone who presumably, I mean, he would have had some degree of education, but what if he had had a Greek education to have been using? That seems unlikely. So, so I think that's always a question that I've had that I don't, I've never read anything that gave me a real good answer to it or a, a satisfying answer to that. But so if we go forward from there, the earliest Christians, they had to try and square off that the me- Jesus had a certain message that didn't always um, jive or line up with some of the t- stories from the Hebrew Bible. And so a, a couple of different schools of thought came through. One was through um, someone named Marcion of Sinope, which is kind of in modern-day Turkey-ish. Um, well, it actually is in modern-day Turkey. But so he had this idea that the Old Testament, and he really focused it all through Greek philosophy, like pure Greek philosophy. And he said, well, this is all the Demiurge, which was a creator. And so he almost had two gods, a god, a transcendent god, and then the creator god who was basically the god of the Old Testament. And as Christians, you don't have to pay attention to any of that stuff. So basically, it starts over at the New Testament, and you go from there. But that didn't really catch fire as much, and the Gnostics used kind of that same thinking. Marcion gets lumped in with the Gnostics, but he really wasn't a Gnostic as such. He just kind of used some of the same philosophical framework that they did to get to some of the same conclusions, but he really wasn't a Gnostic as such. But that's another story for a different day. But so then really two schools of thought come out of the really the very earliest Christianity within the first hundred or so years. One comes out of Antioch in Syria and one comes out of Alexandria in Egypt. And, you know, both of those, Alexandria is the number two city in Rome, Antioch's the number third city in the Roman Empire. These are high um, high education places, a lot of thinking are coming out of them. And they are, both have long traditions that go into older Judaism, Second Temple Judaism. You know, there, so it's a, and both of those places are mixing in Greek philosophy into them as well. So they're, you know, that's all kind of like stewing together in the instant pot, but in different ways. 
And so basically in the Alexandrian view, they are taking Greek philosophy and Greco-Jewish philosophy of, say, the early, um, the very late era, uh, before the Common Era, early Common Era, like Philo of Alexandria, and they're coming up that the uh, the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, should be viewed in a purely allegorical form. You have these stories, and what can we pull out is what's the real meaning? So if there's a problematic text like um, uh, Samson kills 10,000 people with a, a jawbone, I don't. Jesus might not be very good with killing 10,000 people. So how do we explain this? It's a story that didn't really happen, or maybe it, something happened, but they wrote it down in a certain way. What are we supposed to really draw from this, not focus in on that this was a historical thing? The Antiochene view was a... Um, I think they call it something like a historical literal view. It's not saying that these things were literal, literal history, but they had a historical element and they use the writers put in certain metaphors, certain uh, literary tropes into these stories to kind of bolster them to make a point. And that plays into something else called typology, which is finding. Um, I guess, allusions, you might say, or precursors to Jesus in Old Testament stories. So one that, a classic one that comes to mind is um, Daniel, when they put the three kids into the furnace, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and what was it, Abnevengo or something? I can never say that one. But so they put those kids into the furnace. I, who does that? Um, Nebuchadnezzar, maybe? So he puts them in the furnace. And um, I can't, the text says something to the effect of that there's a, um, they, they don't burn up in the furnace, but they're, because they're protected by, um, they see someone in the furnace. And it's sometimes translated as angel. It's sometimes translated in different ways. But the people are interpreting that as it's Jesus in there in a pre-incarnate form. So that's an example of typology. They're taking a, taking one of these um, stories from the, uh, the Old Testament book, and then they're saying how Jesus was there or how the Holy Spirit was there or something. So that's kind of the way that they're trying to reimagine the Old Testament text. So you've got like these three different ways and eventually, um, to make a long story even longer, <laughs> it's basically when, <laughs> as you go throughout history, it's really those three things, those three different ways of either the Old Testament is something that should be ignored, the Old Testament should be p- viewed purely allegorically, or it should be literally viewed is the way that theologians throughout the entire rest of the history until this day are trying to make sense of those Hebrew Bible Old Testament stories. It's very interesting what you say. It's, it reminds me, it, they probably were influenced by each other all the time, but uh, when Alexander the Great conquered most of uh, Persia and uh, of course the Levant and Egypt and he created Alexandria. Then uh, this place was the Levant, ancient uh, Judea, was part of the Hellenistic sphere, which means that they copied or were influenced by a lot of ideas that were floating around, probably freely and safely. Even after the, even after when Alexander died, and they were like the inheritance war, inheritance wars. And they divided all of his empire into diadox. Uh, this place was governed by Greek people. When the the house of Hashmonai, that were like uh, ancient Israelites, elites, uh, like uh, how do you say, nobles, uh, when they um, rebelled against the Seleucids. Uh, Then they created some kind of a proto-nationalistic country that is kind of similar to modern-day Israel in some senses. Uh, One that you have a control over your area, 
a national control over your holy places, as opposed to being a vassal or under control by an empire, or in exile, because Nebuchadnezzar, 200 years before exiled lots of people, twice, <laughs> probably. Uh, and also you have diaspora that lives outside of your country. They had some kind of a nationalistic pride, but they also were very, very influenced by the Hellenistic world. Uh, their names were Greek, so to, so to speak. Some of them were named Alexander, some were named, were named uh, Horkanus, Greek-sounding names. And in their times, you had kind of a three-headed divide like you talked about, only inside of Judaism. You had the elite way of practicing Judaism, which is through the temple, through ritual, and through the family of the priests, the Kohanei, sons of Tzadok, the Kohanim. You had a, another sect that some people say that Jesus was maybe part of that sect, the Essenes, the Essenes. They were, I think, the most modern compa uh, comparison that you can make uh, is to right-wing religious uh, nuts. They were the people who lived in Masada, that was destroyed in, uh, by the Romans, and they were the people who wrote the scrolls of Qumran, which is the ancient, most ancient real text that uh, survived of the Bible. And there was another group, and this group eventually won history. They were the Purushim, which is the root parash, is to interpret. They, like you said, like the Alexandrians maybe, they believed that the Bible is allegoric. And we can't, through the ritual that we do in the temple, we can't really speak with God. They had like a more transcendent uh, way of thinking about the deity, not through ritual in a real live place. And when the temple got destroyed eventually by the Romans, their faction completely won. The, the Judaism, the second temple Judaism became more or less modern Judaism that we see now. We abandoned the real life ritual of sacrifice, sacrificing animal in a real place on earth into imagining the sacrifices as something more personal. We are no longer sacrificing animal. The sacrifice is got transcendent into mitzvahs, 600 and something mitzvahs that you do like basic day to day activities. Then they took the entire Bible and asked, them, asked themselves themselves where did we get wrong or how come that God abandoned us abandoned us in the end and then they became the best lawyers ever because they took the holy text the law and just interpret it and try try to find ways to be even more um, strict and hardcore and apply and following the letter of the law and finding even stuff that are not even there like the kosher laws is even more strict than it was because a lot of the interpretations that they made, the conclusion that they got that you need to be even more harsh. So if the original uh, law was don't eat meat that was cooked in oil, in the oil of his mother, because that's why, what the heathens are doing, they said that that's, that is not enough. Milk, all of milk, all milk products, all of the, you do not mix them whatsoever. I mean, I have a theory that I'll probably never be able to prove, and maybe I'll have to go back and um, get a PhD in this. But my, th and, uh, you know, from my reading is that there must have been in the earliest time, like around the late CE or early CE, late BCE, a huge percentage of the population going into modern day Syria and Turkey and Egypt and maybe even into Libya, the the population of, you know what, I guess you might call at that point, second temple Jews 
must have been enormous. I mean, there's even like a little bit of evidence for that, that in Alexandria, I think somebody, I can't remember the source, but said that there could have been up to a third of the population of Alexandria was Jewish. And I, my thought is that that was, so that huge diaspora, but there's, they still have connections to their original land, but they're starting to drift away a little bit, too. They're getting more exposed to Greek ideas and Egyptian ideas and all these ideas of these other people. And so, you know, some of the customs are becoming more conservative, but then some of them are becoming looser, too. So things like they're, you know... In some places, they're becoming more conservative with the kosher laws, but in other places, they're becoming a little more loose with the kosher laws to fit in. So you see those ideas with diaspora. Sometimes diasporas completely blend in with the with the population that they move into. And then other times they become closed off and become even more conservative than the original population. And I, my theory is like I said, and I'm not a scholar in any of this, and so I'll never be able to prove any of it. But I think that this huge population was out there. And as you left kind of that core of modern day Israel, it was, you There was a lot of them, but it would get less and less and less. But you still had a Jewish uh, quarter in Rome. It wasn't enormous, but there was one. And they knew that there was Jewish communities even as far away in Spain very early on. And I think that those were kind of fertile grounds for the very earliest Christianity, that they're coming in, well, you don't have to follow the law exactly in this way. You can follow it in this way. No, maybe that makes sense. And I think that's why you saw that like in by like the 300s. I think they, you know, that some of the demographers and sociologists say that the pop, that the Christian population of the Roman Empire was maybe in the twenty five ish percent, but it was huge in the East, and you know could have been as low as below ten percent in the West, and I think it's because. It, there was this this population of Second Temple Jews, if you want to call them that, who kind of they were, and there's a lot of evidence for this too, that they were, you know, they kind of had one foot in with the new Jewish movements were coming out. They had one foot in the Christian movements that were coming out. So there, none of this stuff was really quite defined yet, but there was this huge population and there's a population that... Both of these religions are getting people and they're they're gaining converts, but it's a lot of this stuff is happening in the East because there was such a large population, like a critical mass population of Jews, Second Temple Jews, who could become Christians. They could become, um, you know, what would become modern Judaism. And there was all these ideas floating around there that you could pick and choose. And so you see a lot of groups, like even in the earliest in um, Paul's writings in uh, Galatians, who some of them were really following one sect, and then Paul would come in, and then they'd become part of Paul's sect, and then they'd flip-flop and back and forth. And I think that sort of thing happened for a long time. And now a word from our sponsors. Yeah, it uh, got me thinking. I also have a theory that I don't know if I'll be able to prove. But so we haven't, in the podcast, we haven't yet reached reached the, the story of Joseph, but and also not Exodus, both taking place in Egypt. But from a couple of readings of uh, Joseph, for me, it's very clear that it was written by someone who was at the time in Egypt. The way that the story is constructed, the point of view is you see everything around you like an incredible set in, uh, in Egypt. You see the Nile and you see uh, Paro, Pharaoh and the castle. And then when something happens uh, in uh, Israel, it's just like inside the tent. You have like one camera, you see the boom uh, overhead and they're just like having a short conversation and going back to the amazing set with all the animals. It's like he didn't even, the, the, the writer didn't even try to make it seem as if there's something going on over, the, it, it wasn't important. So 
and I, I know I have a hunch that it might be the same with uh, Exodus. We haven't gotten there yet, so I don't know. But just like something to think about that it gives, uh, if you look at the perspective from the text, uh, you can see where they were imagining things, things from and drawing things from. And also, I guess in the story of Joseph, there are several references that I think are Egyptian gods that their names have been changed into Pharaoh. But I, I have to get back to you on that. So that's to your point about mixing all kinds of religious uh, elements inside your whatever faith. One thing that always um, interested me is you get this idea from the texts that like Jerusalem and Israel was so far away from Egypt, but it, are you able to drive there from now? Now, like if you want, maybe not now with COVID, but could you drive if you wanted from Tel Aviv to Alexandria? It is possible. Uh, it will be kind of hard because of the relation, the ge- geopolitical relationship uh, between the countries, but. But we can drive to Sinai pretty easily. And I know that there was a bus line in the 70s and 80s who went from the Tel Aviv Central bus station all the way to Cairo. Uh, and, and my grandfather went on trains from Tel Aviv directly to grandfather in the 1920s. How long would that take? The bus ride, I think it was 12 hours, I think, something like that. So uh, I think if... For ancient people, it's like five day trip, maybe seven day trip. If you, uh, yeah, I mean, that's really not that far, no, it's not and that far. it's no. in ancient times. And it, you know, they make it out like it's such a divide between the two, like basically, like even with Moses, like for him to go back was like such a big deal, and it was such a, a separation from Egypt. But I mean, so you could walk it in a couple of days, I mean, that's pretty close, yeah. From- yeah, it it's pretty close, but if you some of uh, the scholars think that the tradition that we came from Egypt is uh, more aligned with the Northern Kingdom, it's a tradition that the people who lived in the north, maybe for them it's a uh, pretty long. I think that the forty years, it the writers of that story wanted to tell us that you needed a generation and a half to pass for the scenes of those people who complained too much to Yahweh, they couldn't uh, reach the, the promised land. That's why the, the, the journey was 40, 40 years and not like 10 days. I wanted to ask you, uh, Stephen, uh, about uh, the evolution of... Uh, the image of Christ, for lack of a better word, either visual or just like has his uh, character changed, like from a uh, hippie way back when to, I don't know, works in Wall Street uh, today, something like that. Like what's the, the journey, the course? I guess the Where real things go fundam- wrong? <laughs> The real fundamental view is, and it's all that's probably been more of the argument in Christianity than how to interpret, say, the the Hebrew text is even the the gospels give that, and there's in some way that Jesus is divine, but he's also human, and how to make that work together. Is he a was he a, just a, a person, a human person, born in time, was um, adopted by God, so to speak? That's the, There's a thing called adoptionism, where basically God kind of um, gives him a promotion over just being a regular person, and that's... So he, Jesus is still just a human being, but, but was kind of raised to being more than just a regular person. It sounds like nepotism. I think he was, he, they were related before, and then he gave the promotion. It still seems too convenient. Or is was Jesus eternal? And this is, gets into the idea of the Trinity, and that's really complicated. And we could spend a, a, a long time talking about that. But um, and that's something that took a lot of time to hash out. Is God is Jesus somehow part God, part human? So like half and half, or three quarters and one quarter divine and human, 
an, another one was human was Jesus born kind of as um archetypical like an archetype of a human being but divinity was poured into him kind of like a jar that's clay on the outside but then you put something really good inside of it so the 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 jar is a perfect clay jar but it's still a clay jar and but like you poured the best um honey that money could buy and that's the divinity inside so the and that's one thought that went was out there and it's really all the way up until today and one way or the other that's the argument is or well then there's kind of the third way was jesus just an emanation of god kind of like um what might be a good kind of like a hologram on top of a um just like a blank so that it's a perfect like a human but it's not a kind of like a mannequin yeah it's a, a perfect human but it's not a hu- that perfect human doesn't have a human um mind or human will it's just divinity the divinity is what really is like the um the animating factor and it's not the the humanity doesn't matter at all and once jesus is crucified and dies that humanity doesn't even matter anymore because it's all the divinity that matters so it's kind of on a spectrum between or and then at the so at that spectrum jesus is completely god a complete god and it's basically the the transcendent god god the father if you will comes down to heaven but fills that archetypal human blank and then that blank is away and it's only the divinity that matters and then you have on the other side of the spectrum that jesus was a person a really good person had a good message uh lived at a pretty rough and tumble time in the roman empire taught a great message maybe the greatest message and but he was crucified and died and he was a just a human being and it's really that spectrum that exists between and it's really even to this day there's people who believe that you know completely human just a great guy all the way to that he was a complete deity what the but being in those extremes, I would say that of the, you know, the how many ever Christians there are today, they kind of all of them, like 90 percent believe something that's kind of in the middle, that Jesus is both human, both divine in some combination. This is very interesting how this is like a different kind of imagination what you are uh, talking about it's like there is a, a text we have all this now let's find the best way to imagine it but obviously with an agenda so like when when we are now going over and over again uh, over genesis and our only agenda is just to find the best stories not the 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 plot that is written but just like find uh, you know hidden things in it so there are two journeys in in genesis that you can look at there's one journey like the emotional journey like it starts the first story is the most distant story god created it did this it did that he pushed buttons so it starts like super 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 distant and then you start like to sprinkle in a little of a, a little uh, a few emotions like uh, sadness like uh, yahweh the second the creation story he's sad and then abraham is the child is taken so he's sad and then you have like uh, in the middle you have like a bitter scream by esau and slowly but surely there's a lot of uh, crying <laughs> Just like really gradually, and in the Joseph stories at the end, it's just like a uh, cry festa. Uh, this is my favorite verb right now, vaivech, and he cried. So vaivech, 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 everybody vaivech. So if you look at it this way, this way, maybe they were imagining their past as distant, and as it came closer to them, then the people started to have more emotions. Because Isaac also is more emotional, I feel less distant than his father than abraham and jacob is uh, always uh, and angry and stuff and joseph oof, he's a crybaby a question i have is and i've been thinking about it so how do you take the abraham going to sacrifice his son story what do you think is the the 
underlying story there? Was it a commentary on that they were doing human sacrifice of sacrificing their children? Or was it maybe a comment against the people who were doing that, their neighbors? There's a couple of uh, hypotheses. First of all, it's a great story. It's very concise. Uh, we like in the podcast to think about it as kind of a art house film with a small budget, especially if you compare it to other major stories about founding fathers that are like big budgeted films with uh, special effects. But beside of that, there's a couple of theories connected to that story. First of all, that child sacri- sacrifice for ancient Hebrews whether in the Northern Kingdom or in the Southern Kingdom, was popular. Popular meaning that even if the elites and the guardians of the secret of the deity didn't actually did it, people have done it. Israelites, Judeans, done it, Canaanites. The way that the Bible looks at it is not that it's like a dark magic and uh, heathenous and blasphemous. It's wrong because it works. The Bible, the writers of the Bible believe that it works. And there is a, even an example from Kings, uh, from the book of Kings, that child sacrifice works. It's dark magic that you can use in real life. There is even an example that the Bible tells us in Kings that the, some kind of an, an alliance between uh, the king of Judea and the king of Israel against the Moabites ended in the Israelites and the Judeans defeat because the king of the Moabites performed child sacrifice in, uh, and basically made his God win over Yahweh. His God, Chmosh, because he had the child sacrifice, now he's stronger than Yahweh and, and he got the boost. Uh, another th- So if you look at it like that, the, the story, the binding of Isaac, you can look at it as like a message that we don't do that. We don't do that. You obey because Yahweh told you to do this, but Yahweh doesn't like it and he saved your son eventually. Another theory is that uh, the original story, I, uh, Abraham killed Isaac. And the people who got hold of that story, who were against that ritual, changed the end and made it like a Deus Ex Machina that uh, God eventually sends an angel. An angel is a misleading word. He sends a, he sends a messenger to save Isaac. One question that I had that always comes back, like we're always talking about like, and people will say like, oh, the Bible is this because of all these, you know, problematic stories of killing or this and that. But People kind of ignore that there's a lot of stuff that's kind of boring in there. Like in um, when they talk about Moses goes on for, you know, how many pages that, oh, you've got to use this kind of cloth to build the tabernacle and it has to be this long and this high and you got to use this kind of wood and you have to do this kind of sacrifice. And it just goes on and on and on. And what do you what do you think? How is the imagination of that changed? Like, is it just people don't really talk about it because it's boring and it was about a specific time in a specific place or do you think that people are trying they try to reimagine it that it has more meaning to it i think it's a lot of it it's boring because it wasn't meant to entertain it was meant it a lot of it was a product for this is like our take it's for elites to explain a way for elites to explain themselves, their own mythology, and give satisfactory answers. Because the way that other people, the, like the common people, the way that they looked at ritual and philosophy and big questions, it's st- stuff that they just know from their day-to-day lives and stuff that their parents taught them. A lot of people who are in the business of surviving doesn't ha- don't have uh, enough spare time to think about larger questions. That's, those are like things that elites or people with lots of spare time do. And, so and, and they also had access to writing and reading, and they could produce those stories. 
and the stories that they produced were intended to draw you in into what Omri talked about, about all the rules. But what people remember and still talk about today, like right now, are stories that were written 2,500 years ago. And, we, and no matter your take on it, obviously, empirically, there's something so strong in them that have, <laughs> you know, just uh, they're everywhere. So this is just like the honey and the poison pill is uh, inside. And the way that we look at the Bible now as the Old Testament and the New Testament, we visualize them as they are in our lives, as books. As uh, You have Tolkien's book, like the abridged version of his stories, and you have the Bible. But it's not like that. It's th- that version was created in the 10th century AD. Even the, the Pentateuch, they were edited by that order probably 100 or 200 years after the fact so the the product itself wasn't intended for consumption that's why a lot of it is boring because a lot of it is technicalities it's like they talk they are talking to themselves and to their ideological rivals that basically believe kind of the same thing there's yahweh there's elohim but no, there's only Yahweh and you need to only to do that for Yahweh. And the other part says, no, there's Yahweh, but there's different kind of aspects of Yahweh. You can do rituals here and you can do rituals there. It doesn't matter. It's, so. like, a, it's, like, a sport, it's like a sports show. Like they're arguing, they're having different takes on things. No, this is the real thing. No, this is the real story. I think the Lord of the Tolkien is a good example because there's people who read those books and they'll read every l- s- sentence and every word of it and try and pull something out of it. And then somebody like me, I like to watch uh, the movies and fast forward to just the time, you know, where like the monsters are fighting each other and you can get different layers of entertainment out of it. But it's, uh, I, I, I love the book. Lord of the Rings, one of my favorites. <laughs> I, it had to be said. <laughs> but now my favorite book is Genesis. Favorite literature of all, of all time. And now a word from our sponsors. A lot of it is like Lord of the Rings and a lot of it is like uh, Star Wars. Uh, because Star Wars now, it's like a religion without political power. There's lots of fan fiction, which is like the common people trying to find answers between the gap. They only had, up until now, like uh, 90s kids and 80s kids, only had like the original text, which is just three movies. Yeah. And from that, they build entire worlds and theories. And when the bigger ups, the higher ups, the, the high priests of Disney, now they need to make a new trilogy they have like serious theological considerations what is canon and what is not canon because there's a line of fan fiction i don't know I, i'm not really a star wars guy <laughs> there's probably yeah. faction and some of them believe that uh, i don't know the mandalorian and the baba fett and they uh, did this and the the race with han solo in the original movie was uh, 500 per sex and not 200 per sex you know so the Bible is kind of like that. And you imagine uh, it's like seeing the entire nine movies of Star Wars that were in the movies themselves were directed by different directors and screenwriters and different styles of in- in storytelling. One is like a well-made uh, Hollywood uh, shot, reaction shot, medium shot, good uh, editing, good uh, uh, camera work. Some of them is like shaky camera, doco style. Some of them are big budgeted films. Some of them are tiny budgeted. So you need to look at it as like a library, a library of many, many voices, sometimes even opposing voices. And, and sometimes even very petty, wow. <laughs> petty voices. I think that that really kind of boils down how religions change. I mean, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, in a way, they all come from a certain source. But when they start looking and start kind of nitpicking and slicing and dicing, that's how you go in different directions and you could honestly see that at some point you might have the canonical Star Wars that's 
put out by Disney. But then you could get maybe in a hundred years, you could see like a Star Wars that's completely different that was taken over by a group of fans. And they're being officially suppressed by Disney that has the real version of it. But, you know, this other one has created a full universe that has its own, you know, aliens and all that other stuff that was based on that same source material. Yeah, that's an excellent thought. And it could well may happen. And one of the things that can make it happen if the ways of making films will become much, much more cheaper. So and it's kind of a similar to religion because they when they started to write religions they only wrote it in cuneiform or in like the hieroglyphics on a tablet so you need to be super elite to have access not only to learn the characters like 5000 characters but to be able to write them on a material that costs money and stuff like that when they invented the alphabet which was like an invention by lower class people who couldn't understand the cuneiform and the hieroglyphics, they created their own system and it was used by merchants and lower classes. Merchants were always lower classes in the ancient uh, world. So the means of production, quote unquote, became much cheaper. And when those guys 100 years from now will be able to make special effects and, uh, you know, battles in space, on their, computer. on their computer without the need of the high priests Ooh, then wow. the, the Star Wars mythology will yeah. take another uh, they will sue them they will <laughs> sue them and then the, that will be over they won't sue them because the temple was burned uh, America collapsed okay. and they burned the, all the studios in Hollywood <laughs> okay. and I mean to play that out even further so they the 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 high priests of Star Wars could sue the these all these different little groups that are making their own uh, fanfic, but so that just drives them underground, and maybe their uh, their interpretations even get more off the beaten path of what the you know the main stream of it is. And now take those people that you just uh, mentioned, Stephen, and try to imagine uh, who they are, what kind of people they are. Do you think that they will be? chill <laughs> do you think that when they will talk about their past and how everything went down do you think that they will make themselves look good <laughs> in retrospect well that's the question isn't it i mean that's really what the question is and who's really right because you figure that you have all these different specialized ones of people who really think you know the mandalorian this and that but then with most things you have most people who really just want to go and watch a movie where there's lasers and pew, 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 you know who don't really care that um the mandalorian i i don't really watch it so i don't know but he's his gun is like a meter long instead of uh ah, you know 0.75 you know but you know when the war comes those people who are now sitting on the fence and they don't mind if it's this or that they will have to choose or you know we have our methods yeah well yeah that's i mean that is the really interesting part and you really see that that's how things go down when there's a canonical and an uncanonical and there's different sects and how powerful are the different sects so maybe with the star wars maybe um you know the Disney is so large that it can just pretty much stamp it all out and it just becomes a bunch of people who, um, you know, they're highly interested fans, but it doesn't really have any more exposure outside of their little group of people. But when you have a lot of different sects that are of equal power or, you know, similar power, then you get that's where major conflicts could come out. And yeah, now I realize the Omri is the earlier point that all this happened after Disney collapsed and then people came in and took all kinds of different stories from there. And then, you know, follow the shoe, follow the this and follow the that and that. And when there's a vacuum of power. Then the factions, you know, they have a fighting chance and then I guess they would get more and more and more extreme with the opportunity to for total victory for, for them and their gods and stories. Or if Disney is smart and they, they are like the Catholic Church, then instead of uh, fighting all those uh, different voices and different narratives, uh, they can just incorporate them into their... Uh, 
the bigger picture and the canon and call it uh, the Star Wars universe, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is okay there. Multiverse. The multiverse. multiverse. And because if the, then if you have multiverse. a multiverse, then you, have, you can have contradicting stories and nobody exactly, cares. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And I think that in a lot of ways, like the... The Catholic Church tried to do that for a long, long time. But I think like the the to Omri's um, metaphor of Disney collapses and it's completely gone. And now you have all these different multiverses is probably the temple of a second temple being destroyed in 69 or 70 AD, where all these groups like, what do we do now? The temple's gone. That the temple was really what was the thing that was keeping all these groups to, together. Who's to blame? Now, what do we do? Who's to blame? You <laughs> did this. You did this. Yeah, and who are we? Omar is always saying, "Yeah, wow." So yeah, this is insane. It, it, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Who are we? And so, do we just try to rebuild the temple? Do we do the sacrifices? But now we do it in our local communities, and you know, keep with the the Kohanim, and uh, or do we have? Oh, we've well, we've got this new thing. We don't have to have a sacrifice anymore, and so they have to. And all these groups are kind of you know similar amount of power, and they're all trying to get the same people. But then you have all the the fence sitters in there too who. You have to try and convince them one way or the other which way is the right way, and th- that's where things get very complicated. So if we, you know, said that Disney collapses and all the the people who really just wanted to watch lasers, do they just go and kind of float away and find new things to do, or do they uh, get attracted to these different sects? And, and I mean, that's hey, that would that's a long process, and we see that really after the fall of the Second Temple, that it was a long, long process to figure out like what do we do now? And the Christians found a way, the Jews found a way, and there was even small groups like you think of the Mandeans. Um, I think there's a few. Have you heard of the Mandeans? They were a group of people. They don't really know much about them, but they. Um, some people think that they were the kind of like the the fanfic of John the Baptist, and they're I mean they weren't a, ever a very big group even back in the day, and the Byzantines really put the um, pressure on them, and they wound up moving into modern day Iraq, and they didn't they never had a really good time through there, and they're kind of in a diaspora now. I just thought of them because um, there's a group of them that live not too far from where I live today but i think in the whole world there's only a few thousand of them but they're kind of like one of those sub sub groups that we were talking about with the star wars and for whatever reason their group didn't catch on or what there's another group um their names um escape me right now but they lived in like way northern iraq and they had um they're, they had a little bit of Judaism beliefs. They had a little bit of Christianity beliefs. They had a little bit of, uh, throughout the years, they took on some of the Zoroastrian. But so th- that was kind of like another subgroup that they lived on, but they never quite caught on like um, modern-day Judaism did or Christianity did. But you see all like these these small, small groups that came out of that splintering and some of them even exist to today. I think that this is a very, very interesting point that you raised because it's not only, maybe it's not only that they still exist today, but the very conflict that you just uh, mentioned is at the core of the first book, arguing, 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 and fighting with each other. And then, you know, it's, not, it's resolved, not resolved, or not resolved. And then this... Uh, Jean is inside uh, Christianity soon after fighting. No, this is God. This is God. This is God. This is God. The same Jean is now transferred to Islam. At first, everything is fine. No, this is God. This is God. Just like this very, very violent time before the collapse of Jerusalem somehow has been stamped into the human culture today. Like so many of the values and just like perspectives about uh, the world. I, I know I, 
I don't want to go on uh, for much longer, so I'll just say in general, but you can see just like clearly in Hollywood movies. Just like the same way of thinking that you can see in ancient stories from 2,500 years ago. You see just exactly this movie, and you have this in that movie. And I can only wonder if we would have had, how different our culture would be if this uh, schizophrenia packed into a book that then spread all over, if that would have been different, I wonder. Yeah, because is it baked into the book or is that what humanity really is? I guess that's kind of the question. It's baked in humanity. <laughs> no, I think I disagree. I think that this is a very was a very, very specific time. It's like a uh, fight club. At the end, he says, you met me at a, diff- at a very weird time in my life. So we just met these people at the weirdest time of their lives. Twice. We enacted over and over, like again, the same thing. I don't know if they were crazy. 400 years earlier, they were probably just like uh, everybody else. But like a series of disasters, just like, and, you know, migration and inside migration. And then the, all the DTs and the writing and everything. Humiliation. Humiliations, right? A lot of humiliations. This is a book, ri- a, 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 like in, in large amounts, written by people who had masculinity issues. Let's put it this way. And I'll just say one quick thing. So, th- what you're kind of saying is, like, say that book was written at a time where maybe this small, this group of people was riding high. And th- that we may have gotten something very different, like maybe, or let's say that they actually were able to push back against it, maybe in, in, not against the Assyrians, but it, you know, if at some early moment when these texts were codified, that they were really like they had won big time, and they're they have a different psyche writing these books, that we get a different outcome out of it, like my initial thought on that is that maybe the reason why all of this happened is because this core that is part super toxic and schizophrenic and part literature maybe that is what and and also it employs a lot of people you know not only to write and copy but also to pontificate so maybe it's just like something that you know hacks into your brain into society's brain and just like if it was a fun loving book i don't know if it would have been uh, as successful maybe a different horror story <laughs> would have, that's interesting that is very it. interesting i i have to think about that some more okay so i'll tell you when uh, i want us to to talk again so we are now in the final stretch of uh, genesis and and then at the end, we're going to do who wrote Genesis. How do you call the two dots? Colons. A colon. It sounds so weird to me because of the colon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because in Hebrew, it's just like two dots. <laughs> That's the word. Oh. <laughs> so colon and then, you know, the creation stories. Da, 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 da. And uh, we have all kinds of, uh, of takes. And we would be very, very happy to uh, hear what you think about those takes once, uh, once they're, how, they're, they're out. And how, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and how do they arrange with what you know of uh, biblical scholarship or what, you know, what it makes you think, whatever. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I know I have had a great time talking with um, both of you. This was, I, I didn't imagine I'm talking about imagination. I never imagined it would go in this direction, but I, <laughs> it was definitely worth it. Thank you again for um, inviting me and talking to me. We should thank uh, Gary of the History of the Bible podcast, our mutual friend who connected us, because I know I had a ton of fun. We had, a, we had an amazing time. We weren't even uh, bummed about doing it again, <laughs> because because the first time uh, collapsed we had a great time and uh, yeah let's do it uh, over and over whenever we have uh, something you know cool to discuss fun talk fun talk